Excellent. So welcome everybody. We're here to talk about the top five skills to stand out as a senior PM in a hybrid world. And I'm Diana Stubner. You'll learn more about me as we dive into today's session. So just wanna kick us off by saying in this new era of hybrid work and dispersed teams, soft skills such as effective communication and adaptability have become essential for maintaining visibility, increasing influence and fostering career growth. Unlike the in-person workplace of the pre-COVID time, where nonverbal cues and spontaneous hallway interactions increase connections, the hybrid world demands a higher proficiency in non-technical and interpersonal skills. So today we're going to cover the top five skills to stand out as a senior PM in a hybrid world, and we're going to do so by focusing on two different areas. One is why soft skills are indispensable to the hybrid workplace and how you can cultivate and apply them to level up. So why does standing out in a hybrid world matter? matter? As you can see here, because hybrid is the new normal. The stats give us an indication that 81% of employees are working virtually. That's a big group. And so it's becoming the way that we're all starting to work. And as a senior PM, you're navigating multiple types of stakeholders because we know that being a senior PM is a team sport. Early in your career, you're focusing on what it means to be a product manager with that expertise under your belt. So you've learned about backlogs and you've learned how to write stories and PRDs. As a senior PM, you're now seeking to drive product initiatives. And that means you need to work with multiple types of stakeholders. Soft skills are what you rely on to engage a range of personalities, whether they be the cross-functional product team of data and design and engineering, or you're working with leadership, or even your own product management colleagues. All of that requires soft skills so that you can engage a range of personalities, align their diverse perspectives, and successfully gain their trust. Last bit, as a senior product manager, it's a critical career point. It's often when a PM decides to go the individual contributor, the IC path, or the manager path. One could also hold off on that decision and remain a senior PM for their entire career. That's very, very common and something that a lot of people love to do. So with today's session, we want you to gain insight into the skills which will help you stand out and consequently have more say in where you would like to go next in your career. The skills and activities we discuss can be applied as individuals, so seeking to learn more about yourself. They can also apply to a group, so if you're leading your cross-functional product team or you're leading your cross-functional scrum team, that is totally applicable as well and it helps to increase performance. You also may be part of a product community of practice at your organization. And that's another way that you can apply all the skills and techniques that we learn about today. So we'd like everybody to take a minute to introduce yourself. So in the chat, just include your location, so where you're coming in to us from, what's your location? A fun fact about yourself, something that, you know, sometimes surprises people, something that, you know, just gets folks to know you better. And then also please share your LinkedIn. It's a great way just to get to know each other and to connect. So give folks a minute and just add in the information into the chat, your location, a fun fact about yourself, and then your LinkedIn. Excellent. Thank you, Mark, for kicking us off. Toronto. Excellent. Nantes, France, London. Welcome all. Great. Keep the links and information coming. Share a bit about yourself and then your LinkedIn or your favorite social media way to follow. And we'll keep on going. Excellent. We've got folks from all around the world. Cool. All right. So now as you get to know a little bit about yourselves, and meet the other people on the Zoom, I'm gonna tell you about me. So I'm Diana Stepner. I grew up in Cupertino, and it's kind of rare that you're gonna meet someone from Silicon Valley, but I'm one of them. I grew up, as I said, in Cupertino, where some folks may know that Apple's from. My background includes over 15 years leading teams in startups and enterprise organizations and digital agencies and software consulting. On the education side, 
I have a master's of information management systems from UC Berkeley. So my concentration was in human computer interaction, I actually started in product management doing user experience research. And then I also have an MBA from Boston University. So I got that business side too. And for me, my interesting fact, I just love connecting the dots between information and people and teams and organizations. And I also really like helping to coach people as they go through their product journey. So very excited again to be talking to all of you today. So a bit of history around me. 10 years ago, I moved from working in London to San Francisco. I immediately went into a remote environment because all of my colleagues were on the East Coast or overseas. Then the pandemic hit and everyone was remote. And since then, I've remained remote, but trended towards hybrid. So what I'm talking about today is from my 10 years of experience being in that hybrid world. So I'm sharing insight, best practices, and techniques that I've done myself and wanted to share with you. So throughout my career, I found that product managers who focus on providing value to the organization, to their customers, as well as to their colleagues, stand out. By creating value, they're having a positive impact and enabling the business to move forward. It's for these reasons I've designed a value framework, and we're gonna go through the value framework today. So to kick, to kick us off is vision. A vision aligns people from data, design, engineering, and beyond. So all the cross-functional stakeholders as a senior PM that you're managing and working collaboratively with, a vision provides them with context, the why, the what, and for whom. A vision anchors you and your team on the path forward. And by drafting a vision, you're showing you understand the market, the people, and the value the company can provide, not just today, but in the future. A person with vision is crucial to defining and realizing the product vision. A person with vision doesn't do so on their own. Remember, being a product manager, especially a senior product manager, is a team sport. As a person with vision, you bring together others through clear and concise communication, which motivates and informs others. A person with vision realizes the future can and does change and knows how to adapt to these changes. So as you can see here, these are the characteristics that help and engage and enable a person to have vision. So what do you do? How do you get your team to be involved in that visioning exercise? One of the ways that I recommend starting out is by taking a break from today. And you can do so through an exercise called Ants and Aliens. So you look out into the future, 30 years out from the perspective of an ant and an alien, and you look across a number of factors. You can see them on your screen. Social, technological, economic, environment, and political factors. All of these, when you look into the future, will inform your customers, your company, and your products. And so you take that step back, disregard today and think about 30 years in the future. What are all the things that you need to keep in mind if you were 30 years in the future? And after thinking big and freeing up from the constraints of today, you're in an excellent spot to define the product vision. So on that note, I do like to say that there's a difference between the product vision and the product. The vision is the motivation for developing the product. The product is a means to achieving that overarching goal. So returning back to the product vision, the product vision typically focuses on two to five years out. You may find that it's a little bit nearer term and that again, that will vary based on your organization. But at all cases, a product vision is extremely important because it provides a clear direction that informs and helps align efforts towards achieving and delivering value. Yes, our value framework. This template folks may be familiar with, it's one from Romer and Pitchler. I've used it before with my teams and really think it hits all those key areas that you need to have top of mind with a product vision. So again, you've taken that 30 year view, freed up your thinking, and now you're applying it to what you want to achieve in the next two to five years 
for the term that your team, your company looks out into the future. So that's our first part of the value framework. Now we're gonna jump over to attunement. So we're gonna have a poll here. We're gonna see what do you think attunement represents? So Eleanor is gonna pop up a poll for us. And from there, we're gonna say, do we think it represents alignment or authentic or understanding? Maybe all of the above, or maybe something else, but take your best guess. Excellent. Cool. Looks like all of the above is winning out. So that's good to see. Excited for alignment as well and understanding. Thank you, everybody. Great to see the participation in the poll. So to build competitive advantage, if you selected all of the above, then you've got the right answer. And Again, attunement helps us to reinforce value. So that's why it's part of the framework. And organizations and employees must cultivate qualities that are often not perceived as critical. Among them are authenticity, empathy, and adaptability in the face of relentless change. Attunement captures all of these characteristics. So it represents all of the above. Attunement is vital for a senior product manager primarily for understanding and responding to customer needs and ensuring team alignment with the product vision, which we just talked about, and staying aware of markets trends. It's essential in managing diverse stakeholder interests and having attunement means you have those soft skills to adapt to the changing environment and encourage innovative thinking. It also plays a crucial role in going beyond mere data to a more nuanced understanding of various human factors which impact a product team and a person's success. So some may be wondering, hey, that's just me normally. That's what I practice. Great. I would like to caveat and say probably yes and probably no. We may not acknowledge it, but we often have to make slight adjustments to our approaches to bring along a diverse range of stakeholders. So for me, bringing your whole self to work isn't literally about presenting every aspect all at once. It's more about being authentic and relevant and leaning into your soft skills. So ask for some feedback and to stand out and provide greater value. You may find out that there are slight adjustments you need to make in one or more areas. So I've represented on the screen here characteristics that I really recommend asking for feedback on. You can do a quick survey or you can just include it in your chats with your cross-functional colleagues. Ask how they'd rate you on a one to five scale in these areas. And that'll really help you amp up your leadership game, as well as improve on your attunement, our new favorite word. Another way that you can get to know and share more insight about yourself is to create an exercise called a README. And a README puts needs and behaviors and personalities out into the open. Creating a README is a great opportunity for self-reflection and is a powerful exercise to get to know yourself and your teammates. I recommend being very open and honest. This way you'll know situations where you can provide help and vice versa. I found creating a README to be a brilliant exercise with remote or hybrid teams as a README makes what is unspoken and usually unknown, clear and known. So again, you've taken time to get feedback on yourself and your capabilities. Now capture all of that in a README and do that with your cross-functional colleagues, maybe with your product team cohorts and just get to know each other better because that helps you to lean in and help each other when you need it. Next, we're gonna talk about leadership. So folks may have seen this image before. It definitely captures product management very well. Ultimately, the art of leading without a formal authority stands as a corner stove of effective product management. A product manager must help motivate and lead their team despite not having traditional direct authority over the individuals they're working with. Such a nuanced stance of influence and motivation calls for an intricate understanding of humans. Goes back to those soft skills we've been talking about. Leading as a senior PM is not just about leadership in the con conventional sense, but it's about the art of influencing and engaging and guiding collaborative work without relying on a direct reporting. 
So the other piece that makes leadership from a product management, especially a senior PM level, is that you're leading people, not things. And you have to understand what makes people tick and how can we empower the team to work we're working with for success and increase the value they bring to the business and to our customers. So you'll often hear people mix up and match leadership and management. I really like this image because it shows the differentiation between leadership and management. And as a senior PM, you're focusing and leaning into that leadership area, even though you don't have that direct influence that you can do through a reporting structure, you do have that opportunity to lean into your soft skills, to get to know your team through exercises like readmes, to be able to provide that indirect leadership more effectively. So what are some characteristics that have distinguished individuals across my career? I've listed them out here. So they apply to senior PMs and also all the way up the leadership team if you wanna do so. And yes, there's a bit of overlap with our new favorite word, attunement. So the characteristics here are the ones, again, that I've seen senior PMs really lean into and stand out in the organization. Autonomy, you wanna have that freedom. Communication, you wanna be able to speak clearly and bring along your cross-functional colleagues on that journey. Especially think about that vision. You want to ensure that they have clarity and understanding about that vision, why it's important, and communication is key there. Relatedness. You want to inspire and have everyone understand and connect. The README um, is a really great opportunity to do that. Clarity, so reinforcing that contribution, how everyone gets together and reinforcing that power of not just one person, but multiple voices and listening. That means active engagement, active listening, being able to respond back with questions and being able to dive deeper into discussions. All of these characteristics are so much more important now that we're in hybrid and remote situations because you don't have that opportunity to just bump into someone in the hallway. You need to be able to communicate, have the opportunity to provide clarity and listen and the other facets here to really stand out in that hybrid world. Another way that you can judge how your leadership characteristics are resonating with your team is through a retrospective. A retrospective is a meeting dedicated to discussing what went well and what can be improved. Often used at the end of a sprint or once a product is released, retrospectives also can be used to identify what may be holding up a team's progress and decreasing the value they provide because a retrospective encourages three things. It encourages learning from past experiences, it encourages learning from others, and also a retrospective enables you to transfer knowledge. To evaluate how your team feels about your leadership, you can conduct a retrospective to discuss what's worked well and what you may want to try to do differently. I think of it as a first draft with your team. You wanna be able to continue to build on that retrospective. You wanna be able to iterate on the findings and increase your team's value and help you stand out on an ongoing basis. So what you see here are four varieties of retrospective templates. There are lots out there too. And it's an opportunity for you to choose the one that you most feel helps you to gain more insight into your cross-functional team and would help them as well as you improve your leadership skills. Next up, we're gonna dive into uniqueness. So got a question for you and please put your answer into the chat. How do you create an environment where unique perspectives can be heard? So please take your best guess and put it into the chat. Again, how do you create an environment where unique perspectives can be heard? What are your thoughts? What do you think? Perfect. Love the answers coming through. Great. Yes. Always ask for feedback, giving time and space. That's perfect. Love the answers. Excellent. So as folks put in their thoughts, I'm going to dive in. So diverse insights are necessary for increasing product value because they bring a wide range of perspectives and experiences to the table. When different voices and views are integrated rather than siloed, it creates a more comprehensive understanding of user needs and market demands. 
Diverse insights contribute to better products by ensuring multiple perspectives are considered, leading to products that are not only technically sound, but also resonate really well with the users and stand out in the competitive market. And I saw some folks putting psychological safety into the chat, a lot of variations of psychological safety as well. But that's what I found really helps. You wanna create an environment where unique perspectives can be heard. I recommend practicing and incorporating psychological safety. Psychological safety calls for creating an environment where it's okay to speak up and responses are appreciated and forward-looking. You're thinking about you know, what we should do next and you're open to all views and viewpoints. It's not soft or easy to incorporate psychological safety, nor does it mean just being nice. Instead, a lot of the phrases that you put into the chat call out and are part of psychological safety, such as honesty and challenging and clarity. And so this quote here is from Amy Edmondson. She's one of the founding voices behind psychological safety. And so if you wanna learn more about psychological safety, definitely recommend following her on LinkedIn. She's got amazing posts that she shares. And I feel that psychological safety is definitely a differentiator and something as a senior PM you want to incorporate into your work to be able to differentiate yourself and stand out. Psychological safety is also important because as the world around us continues to evolve, so do our customers and so do the interactions and the expectations they have of our products. Even though a foundational job to be done is likely to remain, how it's addressed over time will change. So to continue to meet and exceed customer expectations, us and our teams must feel comfortable evolving our thinking and approaches. Tip of the hat to remembering our vision that we talked about earlier. The opposite being, if individuals don't feel that they have that environment of psychological safety, they may stagnate and feel unheard and consequently decrease their effort by suffering in silence. And that's not something that we want. So as a senior PM, again, recommend incorporating psychological safety into your practices. Doing so will help you and your team stand out and increase the value that you provide to the organization. We also are in a tough, tough economic time. And so that's again, why I really lean into psychological safety. In times like today, people feel uncomfortable to speak up. They're concerned about their roles, their job, the future. So you wanna ensure you establish that safe space and enable those unique voices to speak up. And psychological safety, in case you're wondering, isn't about abandoning responsibility. It's about fostering a culture where every unique voice is heard and valued, where the team collectively navigates the roadmap and contributes to a shared vision. So we've got this exercise that you can do to determine the level of psychological safety in your cross-functional team or your product team, or the group that you work with most often. There are three different approaches that you can take. One is shown here. But first, there's one that's lightweight. You can simply listen. Remember we talked about that active listening? You can listen out for signals, such as how you hear people admitting mistakes. Do they admit mistakes? Do folks feel comfortable challenging each other or suggesting ideas? Midweight is what we see here. And you use these performance quadrants to facilitate a discussion. I'll go into each in a bit. Heavyweight, if you wanna dive in deeper into psychological safety and that pulse within your team, you can also do a full survey. But diving into this middle version here, we've got apathy in that bottom left. A team will, with neither psychological safety nor drive will perform, but they'll be unhappy and reluctant to work. Comfort zone, that one right above apathy, so that top left, is when a team has high psychological safety but without a drive to succeed, they may not reach their potential for performance. They just feel comfortable. Anxiety, bottom right. If a team has a low psychological safety, but is highly driven, the results can often be high, but there's gonna be so much stress and likely lead to burnout. High performance is that upper right-hand quadrant and where you wanna be, that's the optimum zone. And it's also called the learning zone. There, you have a great deal of psychological safety and demonstrate a strong drive to results. It's called the learning zone because team members are empowered to innovate, experiment, and learn from mistakes. 
This is the team that will deliver on their goals. Next, we'll get to the end of our value framework with enjoyment. So in the chat, let's share what was something fun you did at work recently? Again, got some virtual wine cheers in the image. But what's something fun that you did in work recently? So I'm going to pause for folks to put in and share. What was something fun that you did at work recently? Awesome. Cocktail making, karaoke, trivia, wine and wine. Love it. Great. Lots of great opportunities. Perfect. So I'm a big fan of a podcast called Culture Lab, and it's run by Aga Bayer. On a recent podcast, a guest recommended thinking about your employees as subscribers. That means people who buy into a product. They also buy into the vision, which we talked about earlier. They'll buy into the company and often the people that they interviewed with. But then every day they need to continue to subscribe, but they may get to a point where they send an email and they're resigning. You may also find that some folks may become demotivated, what's been termed quiet quitting. Through positive leadership, again, one of our earlier framework characteristics, you can help to encourage your team to continue subscribing. And how do you keep people subscribing? You do so by creating a culture where people can thrive by incorporating fun, belonging, and meaning into your work. So those three, fun, meaning, and belonging, are the three pillars of a thriving culture. So the first one, what often comes to mind when I'm talking with product people about these topics is a quote I heard in a movie. I later found out that it was from a Greek philosopher, but it goes, if you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid. I know that may be a little bit interesting to apply to work, so I use the phrase purposeful play. So to align to the work environment, purposeful play refers to purposeful engaging activities decided, designed to have fun. You wanna foster creativity and team building and enhance innovation and collaboration. So when we accept or even welcome the possibility of having fun at work, we liberate ourselves to learn, to be curious, to investigate. In essence, we unlock our capabilities for greatness. And that again, helps us to stand out and to bring more value. Belonging at work refers to the feeling of being part of a team where one's contributions are valued, uniqueness is respected, belonging is crucial as it enhances teamwork and employee engagement. So to increase the sense of belonging within your team, here are four steps that I recommend. So you wanna work on building trust by being open and clear, goes back to the psychological safety and the uniqueness we were talking about before. You also wanna think about yourself. What are situations where you feel comfortable to speak up versus holding back? Because that may inform you about ways that you can help others speak up. You wanna keep those connections coming. Again, as a senior PM, you're working cross-functionally. You wanna make sure that you're connecting and getting to know your colleagues. Again, our readme, and you wanna keep on learning. Product management doesn't stay the same. So we always need to encourage and incorporate learning. Then we have others going into meaning. So while belonging reflects the environment, meaning is about you. What drives personal motivation and job satisfaction? Remember the README, that also helps us identify what really motivates you and helps you get to know your colleagues. And so by getting to know everyone, you help to increase their sense of meaning. By bringing more meaning to your team's work, you increase the value to the company through fostering deeper engagement, motivation, and commitment. This heightened sense of purpose often leads to higher productivity, innovation, and job satisfaction, which again is a key driver of value and ultimately organizational success. So you got a lot of great tips in the chat. Others that I'd recommend are campfire conversations. So really, you know, just fun, playful conversations similar to those that you may have around a campfire. Onboarding and celebrations are a great way to bring everybody together and help people know that you've listened, you appreciate them and help them to also stand out. An exercise I do to encourage that fun, meaning, and belonging is called an hour of learning. And I've applied it throughout my career. It really helps to bring people together as a way to get to know each other. You can do it at the end of the week to celebrate wins. You learn more, you grow the team's collective knowledge. If you have a product community at your organization, you can introduce an hour of learning. If you already have an hour of learning, just weave in some fun into the mix. 
So as we come to a close, I wanna say thank you very much. And also just to reiterate those five top skills to stand out as a senior PM in a high-bred world. I've designed them differently here. And that's because there's a lot of overlap between those five skills. And that's a really good thing. By building up your muscle in one skill, you're providing a foundation in another. All together, these top five skills will help you to be a better senior PM, stand out by adding more value to the company, to the team, as well as to yourself, and thereby helping you to be in a better spot to define your next career step. So wanna close just by saying you've got this. Thank you very much for all the chat conversations that we've had. We're gonna bounce over to the Q&A. And so we'll take a second to see which questions are top voted. Please add more questions too. And then we'll dive into the question and answers. Thank you, everybody. All right. And as Eleanor shared with us, please upvote your favorite question. Continue adding questions too. Awesome. Top voted question I can see here is from Wendy. She's got, how do we foster psychological safety within a team when the company seems to be lacking it or is going through a tough moment? That's a great question, Wendy. And the way that I recommend doing it is by starting. You as one person can actually incorporate and enable change. And so by the practices you incorporate within your cross-functional team or in, within your product group, those can start to be the ripple effect that creates a change within the organization. I read a number of articles about psychological safety and what the recommendation is, is you just start, you start practicing it. And then there are individuals that you work with on a frequent basis who you will notice are also starting to incorporate those practices. Together, you can then reach out to more parts of the organization. And it takes about 33% to be able to create that pivot. So if you can create a bit of change within your own group, you can then help to invoke and create change across your organization. And that's why I recommend starting with psychological safety. You can also use the exercise that we talked through with that grid because you can use that to share with you know, others within the business just to let them know the changes that you're making and the reasons why. So help providing that context and the communication to help them understand the value of psychological safety and also to let them know how you're incorporating it with your cross-functional team. Next one. We've got a couple with six, so we'll start with those. The top one is from Radesh, and he says, my experience is that soft skills have a lot to do with the language you use. I'm trying to improve the word choices and way of expressing myself and words and emotions. What suggestions would you have for me to improve my language and visual cues and emotions make those improvements? So really, really great question. And it goes back to asking for feedback. I think one of the ways that helps us to understand and learn how we can better resonate and connect with our colleagues is to ask for their feedback. So when you're doing a presentation or doing a share out, take some time at the end to be able to ask for feedback. That will help you learn what words may not have been clear or areas where you may have needed to dive in a bit more. So you can use one of the templates that we went through in the slides just as a starting point and morph it to your own usage as well. The other thing that's often helpful, especially when you know, you're new to a team, new to a company, is just to take note of some of the words that people hear and say. It sounds funny, but a lot of times organizations have their own kind of vocabulary. So if you can start picking up on those words that people use commonly, that will help you weave in them into your vocabulary and help create that common sense of understanding. So again, ask for feedback on your approach, but also actively listen to how others speak as well and be able to identify words that they use that you may not. And then how can you incorporate them into your approach too? Got another six with Karthik. Are there any books, oops, it just bounced. Are there any books and resources that we can read more on the tactics discussed? 
So you're going to get the slides, which is a great reference point. Always recommend Reforge artifacts because they're amazing. And also I'll be providing more soon. For me, you can follow me on my newsletter. So it's dianastepner.substack.com. I constantly talk about the materials that we covered today. A link to my newsletter will be incorporated when we do the share out at the end, but it's a great way just to continue to learn. And so that will help with resources. I also reference a lot of books and other newsletters. As you can see, I love podcasts, so I incorporate them a lot too. All righty, we got another six with what strategies do you recommend for managing up when your leader, leaders lack attunement? And so Bianca, it's a really great question. There were a couple of different ways that I recommend. It'll depend on the culture of your organization. Some parts of the organization may be very writing focused. And so you can practice attunement in the writing that you provide. You may do PR FAQs, for example. There may be a strong culture in regards to writing and providing guardrails around the work that's being done. Your words can be thoughtful. Your words can show incorporation and feedback from others. Oftentimes, just including at the top of a document all the individuals who contributed helps to raise the voice that you're not just speaking alone, you're helping to support and guide a team. You're adding more value through the organization by helping all of these individuals come together and consequently you'll stand out. The other way that I do so is just by having sessions where we do practice what we talked about today and inviting a senior leader to listen in. It'll be amazing for them to see the amount of insight and knowledge and learning that happens when multiple voices are shared. So again, you can be the start of that change and help others in the business be able to see the benefit of having a variety of voices, not just one soloist, but a whole variety of unique voices contribute. So again, start being that change. And from there, you can identify colleagues who feel the same. You can have them start reaching out to their coworkers and you can start making that ripple effect. Also through performance, a lot of times when an organization doesn't embrace psychological safety, they'll see the teams that do exceed. And so one of the examples I would give is Project Aristotle at Google. You may have heard of it before, but Google was trying to study what made effective teams stand out. And there were you know, a number of characteristics, but the differentiator was psychological safety. The teams that weren't practicing psychological safety were not sharing their mistakes. They were making the same mistakes again and again and again because they didn't feel comfortable to share. With the teams that were incorporating psychological safety, they talked about their mistakes. They celebrated, they learned from them. And as a result, they didn't make them again. So they were able to advance more quickly. So you can also let your work speak out. Because by incorporating psychological safety, you're going to help your team be able to move faster. You're going to help your team be able to learn. And you're going to make a difference that will enable you to stand out. Other ones we got in the questions. Cool. All right, going to Justin. You shared some exercises to use. Can you speak to the frequency of doing these? Quarterly, weekly, daily, etc. How often is enough for some soft skills versus actually during the work, since you need to still do the work? Very good point, Justin. You definitely need to do the work. The frequency, I would say, depends. It'll depend on two factors, one on the exercise itself and one on your team culture. For example, the README is something you could do once and then put it away for a year. Come back to it in another year and see if things have changed. So the README, you can do once and be done. Items like the hour of learning. At some organizations I've been at where it was a very strong learning culture, we did an hour of learning every week. We had somebody from the other parts of the business. We had someone who went to a conference. We shared baby pictures and got to know each other. And so you can determine the frequency of the hour of learning. Again, if your organization is really big on learning, do it every week. If your culture is more of you know one and done, you may wanna do it once a quarter. So again, think about what's right with your organization. Don't force it, but just lean into your culture. What really is the best given that your company and how it works. And again, the work that you need to do. 
All right. Next one we got. How do you navigate an organization that is limiting the growth of the product org? I feel limited in my growth as there is not upward opportunity as a senior PM. Alex, great question. I think a lot of us are feeling that now, just given the economic environment we're in. There are a couple of things I would say. You're already doing an amazing thing by he being here today and learning through these sessions. So please continue to learn. If a company has a professional development budget, that's another great, great way to learn. You can continue to be able to upskill. I'll go back to Reforge Artifacts. Again, they're, they're free, a great way just to learn other practices, how other PMs have been done strategy and have done vision and have done other exercises that can help you really tune up your skills too. The other piece I would say is lean into the opportunity. One of the things that we're finding is product management is starting to incorporate other roles too. So for example, Product management will sometimes lean into user experience research. So you can build in chops there. You also may find that product management leans into data. So think about other areas within the business where you can lean into and continue to build your skills. So even though you may not be moving up the organization, you're continuing to build your framework, your toolkit that you can call upon, and that will help you to continue to learn and to grow in your senior product management journey. Next one, we've got Raji with how do you create alignment and buy-in within an organization that was histor historically IT team driven and are now shifting towards product and agile mindsets? Great question, I've been in that place too. So I think it's really important to lean into that cross-functional communication and collaboration. Oftentimes what happens is a wall comes up between you know, the IT organization and other parts of the business. And so folks start to feel siloed. You want to ensure that the voices continue to be heard. So you want to continue to seek IT feedback, to have those engineers involved early in discovery and there through to define, develop, and deliver. You want to ensure that they know that they're being incorporated. The other piece though, is by having multiple voices, not just IT, but having design and data and others as well, IT becomes one voice, not the only voice. And so you're able to manage across the different types of functions that you have working on your team, ensure IT continues to feel heard, but begins to acknowledge that there are multiple voices that also need to be listened to and appreciated because the product represents our customers it doesn't represent just how we build something. So we need to put our customers front and center by hearing from more voices across our cross-functional team. And you can do so by practicing the skills that we learned today. So we got a last question and then I know we're at time. How would you approach working with new team members in a different country specifically to grow empathy and connection due to cultural differences? It's a really great question to wrap up today with Catherine, appreciate you putting it in. And a lot of it, I can say I've learned through experience. When I lived in London, I worked with individuals all around the globe. And when I moved back to the US, it was the same. I incorporated the README. It was a really, really good way to be able to get to know my colleagues. Also with the hours of learning, we share traditions that we do in each of our countries, again, to learn more about each other. And by practicing psychological safety, we had that channel to be able to clarify and communicate more effectively. So I think your question is a great summary to today. You've captured a lot of the points and the reasons for what we do and why we wanna practice value. So I hope everyone had an amazing time today. I really love speaking with you and answering your questions. So thank you very much everybody and wish you a, rest, a great rest of your day or evening or morning, depending on where you are. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Diana, for this great event. Thanks. Bye, y'all.